Sabbath morning to all. Can can someone confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, brother Gerard. A little louder, though. Okay, okay. No, no problem. Thanks very much. Um, a pleasant Sabbath to all again. And as we get into our Sabbath school study, I will just recap briefly some of the things we touched on last week. Then we will pray and continue with our study. We, we, last week, we were looking at true godliness, and we were just touching on this section in chapter 15 of the study book. And I will just read, this is on page 157, the last paragraph before the section, the secret place of the Mosai. It says, we arrive at the inescapable conclusion that godliness requires an even deepening, consistent prayer and devotional life. No one can live a godly life without much prayer and progressively advancing study of God's truth. And Elder Leacott would have touched on some of the principles which constitute practical godliness. Um, so we, we see that it is impossible for us to be truly godly if there is a lack of prayer and devotion, and not just from the standpoint of having devotion every morning or evening, but as Elder Leacock mentioned this morning, that genuine nearness and drawing to God. And that is brought to view through that deepening, abiding relationship in John chapter 15. So we are going to pray now, and we will just look at the next section there on page 157, the secret place on the mo most of the most high, and continue from there. I invite you to pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your tender mercies toward us, for your faithfulness, for your providence, your protection. Those who may be ill at this time, we uplift in a very special way, asking that you will bring healing, restoration, and comfort. And as we go into the study of your word, quicken our minds, that as we share with each other, that we may be humbled to receive your thought, that we might experience true godliness and come up to the mark of your high calling. Bless us and continue to keep our minds focused on you even now, for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, if there are any questions, please um, indicate by the raising of your hands. You can stop me at any time. As I said, we are going to move on to the next section there at the bottom of page 157, the secret place of the Most High. And Psalm 91 verse 1 is quoted, a very familiar passage of scripture that says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And the question is asked, what is this secret place of the Most High? Um, and, and that is a question that I will throw at this point in time to the class. What is this secret place of the Most High?
Any, any volunteers? This, the verse says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And in that shadow, there is peace. As I see someone's hand is raised, go ahead. Yes, um, the secret place is in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. um, constantly being in prayer and, 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 and seeking God in every area of your life, every decision you make, that's the um, secret place. Okay, okay, thanks very much. Um, no, th there are a number of there are a number of points made thereafter, um, four points. But if we look at the top of page 159, um, the second paragraph, it says, the secret place of the Most High is in Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. So remember last week, when we ended, we said that we will continue this week looking at what Christ is doing for us at this present point in time. So it says here, the secret place of the Most High is in Christ, in the heavenly sanctuary. Ever since the end of the 2300 days of Daniel 814, Christ our High Priest has been in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. There is where the judgment seat of Christ is situated as he performs two particular functions. The first one, the pre-advent judgment while continuing his work of intercession. And the second one, he is working to perfect the character of his remnant church for the last battle in the great controversy. And we know that unless we have an appreciation, first of all, of the sanctuary truth and that there is truly a sanctuary in heaven not made with hands according to the hebrews if unless we understand and accept and believe this we will not be able to cooperate with our high priest as he performs the, this pre-advent judgment this was since 1844 neither will we be able to cooperate with him as he works to perfect holiness and godliness, godly characters in his remnant church. And, and that particular sentence ends off by saying, for the last battle in the great controversy. So we are living in a, a great controversy there's nothing that we can do about that in terms of um, we cannot remove ourselves from the controversy. It is either that we choose one or the other. And in order to be under the banner of Prince Emmanuel, we must allow him to perfect holiness into our characters right the next the next paragraph says access to god's grace in this end time therefore means dwelling in the secret place of the most high by abiding in christ as the brother said and cooperating with him in his work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary now what i would do what i would like to propose at this time can someone read the quotation there from Great Khan, page 488, that, say, that begins, Satan invents? Any volunteers? Yes, I agree. Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds that they may not dwell upon the very work with which we ought to be best acquainted. The arch deceiver hates the great truths 
that bring to view an anointing, an atoning sacrifice and an our powerful mediator. He knows that with him everything depends on his diverting minds from Jesus and his truth. Thanks very much. No. Ella Leacock mentioned this morning in devotion that there is more power in grace than in sin. And we see here in the, the middle of the paragraph, the arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice and an all powerful mediator. Now, it is one, now Satan knows that God is more powerful than he is. Satan knows that Christ's mediatorial work is efficacious to perfect us. But you hear what the, sta the statement says? He, hate, he hates these things and his having a hold on our lives depends on diverting our minds from Christ and his truth. So it is one thing to have an all-powerful mediator, but if we do not know it to begin with, and even if we know it um, in terms of a book knowledge, but we do not believe and experience it, we will not experience that victory over sin in our lives, right? Um, can someone else read the next quote, the next paragraph, the, the quote continuing, this is on the same page, page 488, the one of page 159 in the study book. Any volunteers? Those yeah. who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure to display or to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith, which is essential at this time, or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate often the scene when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened. When with Daniel, every individual must stand in his law at the end of the day. Thanks very much. So, so we see from this particular paragraph, the same point is being borne out that this probationary time which we have here on earth must be spent wisely and we're told exactly what where our focus should be at this time it says it should be devoted to an earnest prayerful study of the word of truth that we may do what understand the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative or the pre-advent judgment that we might have a knowledge for ourselves of the position and work of our great high priest and, and the next sentence says otherwise it will be impossible for us to exercise the faith so there's a there is a particular faith that must be developed by the final remnant living elect. Otherwise, it will be impossible for us to exercise the faith, which is essential at this time, or to occupy the position which God designs for us to fill. 
So God has a particular position for us in this particular time of Earth's history. And until we understand that, until we appreciate that, until we commit ourselves to finding out what it is and surrendering our wills to God, that he might work it out in us, it will be impossible for us to endure to the end of the final crisis. Any questions or comments? The, the next two paragraphs under the section, the very center of Christ's work, I'm just going to go through these last two paragraphs and then we will move into the area of practical godliness from the next chapter. It says, all who have received the light upon these subjects, referring to the sanctuary, are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. So right now in our world, there are many things happening. Um, there are lots of devastations on one hand, and where there may not be devastating events, there are many other events taking place that strive to, gra to grasp our attention. But here we see that the most important work that has been done is not the work to revive the national economies, important as that may be. The most important work that is being done in the universe is the work of our great high priest on behalf of us fallen human beings. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of redemption bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asketh them a reason of the hope that is in them. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Now there are persons or even groups, as in church groups, who believe that when Christ died for us at Calvary, that that was the end of his work for us as human beings. He died for us, our sins are forgiven, and this whole notion of an atoning sacrifice or, well, that was the atoning sacrifice for them, but as it relates now to perfecting holiness in us and Christ being in a sanctuary in heaven is lost to view. It says that the intercession of Christ in man's behalf currently in the sanctuary in heaven is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered. There, the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. The plan of, sorry, the salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. It is a free gift to us, but it came at, a, at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands 
of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne and through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith may be presented before God. Great Con, Great Controversy, page 488, 489. So here we see, brethren, that we have an high priest, as Hebrews 11, not Hebrews, as Hebrews, can't remember the chapter exactly, but as in Hebrews, we are told who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and he is interceding in our behalf. And if we allow the enemy to divert our minds through his unnumbered schemes, we will be in jeopardy of losing our souls. So if there are no questions based on that, you can let us turn to the next chapter, chapter 16, which is where we will be focusing on practical godliness. So it says a life of godliness or piety is a life of holiness. It is a life lived in harmony with or obedience to biblical principles of holy conduct through the abiding relationship of you in Christ and Christ in you, according to John 15. Now, we're going to turn to our Bibles. to Ephesians chapter five, right? There are four particular chapters that are mentioned here. Ephesians five, Colossians three, and Titus chapters two and three. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter five. There are eight key points that are brought to view in the study book. But I would like us to pinpoint any others that we can find in the chapter, right? The eight are listed in this study book, the bottom of page 162 and the top of page 163. So we're not going to read through the chapter, but I would like for persons to volunteer and point out any of the other key points and share them with the class. The first one listed in the book is being followers of God, right? Which is, which is found in verse one, which says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So if it is, before I get to Cecilia, if it is that we profess Christianity, but it is difficult for us or even impossible in our experience as it relates to following God, it means that we cannot, we cannot call such a person as being godly, okay? Because the first premise is that we must follow our master. Is this easier? Go ahead. I just want to give one of the points I, I picked up mm -hmm. in verse two. It says, and walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. Correct. Correct. Thanks very much. Walking in love. Walking in love as Christ has loved us. And, and what kind of love did Christ have for us? I would say a selfless love. A selfless love. Later, later down in the chapter, when um, if we look at verse 
25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So here it is that the love that Christ has for us caused him to give his life for us, right? For his church. And that is the same love that we are to walk in. Whether it is to our workmates, whether it is to our brethren, our extended family, under every circumstance and situation, we are to walk in love. Um, in verse 3, which is also listed in the book, it speaks about shunning sexual immorality and all uncleanness. Right? As well as not being covetous. Right? These, these particular points are brought to view in the study book. Verse 4 says, well, let, let, me, let me read verse 3 and move on to 4. It says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which is not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. What, what is this? Um, when it says, which is not, which are not convenient. What, what, what does that mean? It says, neither uh, filthiness. Different. Sorry? Um, I could not find my top to raise your hand, but Brother Gerald, good morning. Good, good morning. Myself. You know what is of interest here uh, as I look at this chapter? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when these books were first written, we were told they were not put into chapters. It was mm -hmm. as it were one letter. Mm -hmm. And we are speaking here about practical godliness. You know, if we were to step back in the former chapter, going for this one, that chapter four, to me, there Paul begins this theme about practical godliness. Chapter 5 began with the word, therefore. Understood. Paul is therefore, um, must be saying to us something has gone before that has led him to draw that conclusion. Be therefore followers. Be their followers. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at chapter 4, Paul is making some serious comparison with the former life with the present life of the Christian. And from his start of, from the goal, verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul begins to enumerate how the Christian should be living. But I just want to look at the latter verses of the chapter and just say a few things here. In verse 3 says, but ye have not so learned Christ. Uh, he must have been looking at some items which were not in the vein of Christ's way of living. And then he goes on to say in verse 22, you have put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. Verse 23, you have been renewed in the spirit of your mind. You have put on a new man in verse 24. Then comes some practical illustration. It says, 25, put away lying. Speak the truth to your neighbors and, want to, and to one another. 26, don't be angry. Say, be angry and say not. 7, 
27. Don't give place to the devil. Others, whatever you do, do not let him get a foothold in your experience. Keep him out. Verse 28. Stop stealing. That was part of your former life. Stop stealing. Don't beg. Go and find work, labor to supply your needs. That you can help those who might need your help. Watch your language, verse 29. And um, that language might also be anger. It could be called what's called filthy communication, deceit, filthy words, foul language. And um, this is Paul speaking. 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Whatever you do, don't grieve him. Live in accordance with his directions. Don't, as it were, stress him by your continual living in sin or continue rejecting his leading or his guidance. 31, it says, when it comes to business, to wrath, to anger, to clamor, even speaking and malice, it says, those should have no place in your life. Put them away. And then it says, it ends with 32. Be kind, tender hearted, forgiving each other, even as God has forgiven you. There could be no more practical instruction for us as Christians than this list that Paul has here pointed out. Of course, it goes on in chapter 5, either to elaborate or um, to refine these. But I thought that that point needed to be made. Paul begins the argument in chapter 4 and probably beyond chapter 4. But here in chapter 4, he made a clear enumeration of things that we should not, as Christians know, having known, come to know Christ, having put on a new man, should be practicing or experience. If they are there, those things that are of your flesh should have been gotten victory on and we should be moved on to higher and our battle should be with higher things, not these things of your flesh. That's my comment. Thanks very much. Praise the Lord. I appreciate it. Um, Brother Rodney Bruce. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasant Sabbath to all. Morning. I just want you to back up, just back up a bit. You were speaking just now of the love of Jesus Christ that motivated him to sacrifice himself on behalf of humanity. I just want to extol more highly what Jesus Christ's love really is. You know, sometimes as Christians, we interpret toleration for love. We tolerate people. It's not that we love them. We tolerate them. You understand what I'm saying? Um, when you look at Matthew chapter 5, and we start from verse 43 and come down. You have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbors and hate thy enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That he may be the treasure of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. But then he, they, they, he draws a, a, a distinction, clear distinction that we Christians need to be clear on. For if he loved them which loved you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publican so? Be therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. What is that perfection? When you go to Romans chapter 5 and look at that perfection and look and see when Christ actually died for us. Verse 6 says of, of Romans chapter 5. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. The ungodly. The ungodly. Look at verse 8. 
But God commendeth his love towards us that while we were yet who? Sinners. sinners. Understand? Look at verse 10. For if when we were who? Enemies. You see, you see the, the extent to God's love? You know, in fact of that, when Christ broke that love, with the knowledge that the, the greater portion of humanity will reject that love, thank God we have today the statement that you should see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. That is the kind of love that we are called to receive in our hearts. The ability to love our enemies, love those that despitefully use us and persecute us. Why? that we may be the children of our Father in heaven. Jesus himself said, By this you shall, that all men may know ye are my disciples, when ye have love one for another. That is the level of love that we are called to receive, not toleration. Infinite, agape, all for the other, none for self, self-sacrificing love. And nothing short of that will get us into heaven. Thank you. Thanks, praise the Lord. Thanks very much. So, so as, as was mentioned, the love here that we are called to walk in goes deeper than many a times we are willing to imagine. But as Brother Bruce rightly pointed out, the ability to love those who as it were, cannot find it in them, in their hearts, to even um, speak to us, who hate even the very best bone, as we would say, in us, for no reason. The ability to relate to such persons, and not only to relate, but also to do good, genuinely, to keep coals of fire upon their heads. This is the love that we are to, to walk in. A any other comments or questions? So, as I mentioned, we are pulling out some of the other key points and it does not necessarily, they do not necessarily have to come from Ephesians 5. So feel free to share. Um, Just another minor point. Sure, go ahead. If I may do so. I referred the class to Ephesians 4. Right. on which I simply listed a few of the items that Paul was enumerating. But I find of interest verse 1. It's for me a very um, center of the entire thing which Paul is presenting. He says here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And that word vocation caught my attention. What is this vocation to which we are called? That Paul is here advising that we walk worthy of. You know, it said that in our life, we have a vocation, a vocation, not vocation, vocation, and a career. That our career is that which we are paid for not so much so our vocation. Our vocation is our true calling. In other words, God gives the vocation. We choose our careers. And we train for careers. And we are, paying for, we are paid for our careers. And whatever God has led us to become is our vocation, it is said. But the Christian has... One can consider how one common vocation, that is, Christianity in itself is a vocation. We are called to live the Christian life. 
and so that Christianity becomes a lifestyle. So that when Paul enumerates these lists of um, attributes or characteristics or qualities, what he is truly saying is that in your life as a Christian, there are things that should appear if you are genuinely, if you are a genuine practicing Christian, if you are practicing practical godliness, there are things that must be seen in your daily living and that you must grow in these things. Just as we were doing all along with Peter's ladder and that there are certain things that must be rooted out, separated from you and should not appear in you because those things that once appeared were not part of the life of Christ. They must be separated from you. And not mean that as Christians, we continue to pray for almost the same thing and for the same victory over and over again. Paul said, no, we should move on. We should go beyond the point we were praying, praying for victory over that, those same things particularly things of your flesh over and over again. We just grow. As we grow up, there are things that we will drop and there are things that we should be growing deeper and deeper in. So I think we should read chapter four and five together. That is as a suggestion. Honestly. Um, so just, just a question. Are there any... Is there anything, well, are there any nebulous areas on any of the particular points that the Apostle Paul brings to you? And, and the reason why I, I ask the question is for, for one reason or another, you know, some of the things that we are called to exhibit in terms of character growth, we may claim that, you know, is either impossible or we may say that there are some gray areas as in how far. So verse two of chapter four continues by saying with all lowliness and meekness. So one may ask the question, how low are we expected to go? How meek must we be to receive whatever might be coming our way? You know, is there a, a point beyond which we must put down our foot, as it were, and um, straighten up the situation? So I'm not sure if, if, if the question is clear. For any of the points that were mentioned or that we can find in chapters four and five, like here, for instance, verse 26 says, be angry and sin not. Is there ever a time that we, I'm not asking if there was ever a time, but can there ever be a time that as human beings, we are angry and not sin? And what would be constituted as an illustration of being angry and not sinning? If I may attempt the Brother, first... I see, I, see, I see your hand. Sorry. I'm not sure if that was from the previous. Go ahead. Go ahead. Morning. Morning again. Hey, hey morning, Bruce. Brother, Brother Ryan, um, to, that, to that very question you asked in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, be angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You have a very applicable application to that statement taken from testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 100, paragraph 2. And it reads thus. It is a righteous indignation against sin, which springs from zeal for the glory of God, not that anger prompted by self-love or wounded pride. That's a whole different. 
You see, Bible says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. But getting back to Merton's point, Merton's, it, Merton's point is very solid when you look at the attributes of godliness. And he speaks about a vo that word vocation. I liken it on to what we are called to when Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, matter of fact, not Paul, but the Spirit of God. When we understand that as Christians, we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. You can't get a higher calling than that. You don't, you don't go and pick an ambassador here on earth any willy-nilly. Ambassador for Christ, you must know the language of heaven. You must have the spirit of heaven. You must know all that heaven desires and obtain for redeem humanity. So to me, it is a very high calling, but thank God it is accomplished not in us, not in our self-effort, but it is accomplished in Christ Jesus. You asked just now, um, how low? Paul in Romans chapter six speaks to how low. We must be baptized into Christ. We must be dead indeed. And that the life that we now live, according to Paul in Galatians 2.20, is not our life, but it's Christ's life. That is the death, and that is the height at the same time. You know, Brother, Brother Saul, I had an experience at a, a baptism recently where Brother Saul says, three events occurs at a baptism. There's a death, there's a burial, and there's a resurrection. The resurrection speaks to the glory of God, the new man in Christ Jesus. That is the height to which we are called ambassadors for Christ Jesus. You can't get no higher than that. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, my, my response, I thank Brother Bruce, my response to the question um, was that the only example we have in the Bible, the fifth one, is that of Christ. How low he came mm -hmm. to where extent he denied himself. Yes. Not to have come as low as we are. He went even below where we are. He went down even to the very shameful death of the cross. Mm -hmm. And for the Jew, the death of the cross was the worst and most shameful kind of death a man could, be, could, could experience. It was a curse to hang on the cross. And Christ went right down there past us in sinful fallen flesh to redeem us. And he did so with meekness. And he did so with the glory of God in him. And I was concentrating here on the text here in uh, Acts 11, 26, near 26 verse. We said the, the, um, the people were fought, the first, the followers of Christ were first called Christians at Antioch. Do you think that they were called so because of what they preach? I don't think so. I think they were called so because as onlookers viewed their lifestyle, how it sharply contrasted with theirs, and how it reminded them of the lifestyle of Christ, his meekness, his loneliness, his forbearance, his love, his forgiveness, they were in tone and in step with Christ. And the onlookers were impressed, even as the priests were impressed with the disciples when they saw their testimony. They so said, Yes, they learned that they have been with, they saw they had been with Christ and had learned of his meek and humble way. So the lifestyle of the Christians at Antioch was that of Christ and led to the name Christian. Amen. Uh, you have two hands up. You have Sister Stacey and, and Timmy. Okay, Sister Stacey, can you go ahead? Okay, I was going to attempt to answer the question, how can um, we be angry and sin not? Mm -hmm. And in the devotion earlier on, we heard that we need to stand on principle. Mm -hmm. 
So if you sign on principle, and the gentleman also mentioned that you need to coerce people, you need to show people by your lifestyle. So you can stand on principle and not be angry with the person who is against the thoughts that you're bringing across. And the second point I want to bring forth is to piggyback on what the two brothers said before me, but it's to, for us to recognize that we have to reach the point where we have to kill self. Self is our greatest enemy. And if we can live a life where we do not please self and please Christ, we will start climbing the ladder to achieve what we are reading in Ephesians 4 and 5. Thank you. And just, just one question, this is easy before you go. Um, is it that we can kill self? No, Christ, we cannot start praying and ask Christ to help us kill that self. Self um, control, um, self exaltation, and we can start praying and ask God to help us in that area. Because remember, the, the last, I think it was last week, we, we were looking at an excerpt from sermon, um, the 1895 sermons, and we saw that it is only as we receive the mind of Christ that we will be enabled to experience the death of self, right? And it, and it doesn't mean, as we mentioned last week, it doesn't mean that when we first accept this, that it will always be, in other words, that there will be no struggles going forward. So, but once we understand what Christ did for us, us being in him, and how he crucified himself daily, then it will be a part of our experience as we receive his mind. Thank you, I agree. Uh, I see um, Timmy, you can go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, I wanted to comment on the, the text that was quoted to be angry and sin not mm -hmm. from Ephesians 4.26. Um, most of the times from among them, yeah, Adventists, most people just agree with the text saying be angry and sin not. But if it was quote unquote an okay thing to be angry, um, Paul wouldn't have added in, you know, let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And then in verse 31, he then says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So he first says to be angry and sin not, but then four verses or six, four, four to five verses down, he then says, let anger be put away from you. And then there's a powerful quote from Sister White in the book Child Guidance. It says, Okay, it says, have it here. Okay, get have it. It says, neither, this is from Child Guidance, page 95. Neither should we lose, never should we lose control of ourselves. Let us ever keep before us the perfect pattern. Listen to this part carefully. It says, it is a sin to speak impatiently and fretfully. Then she says, or to feel angry even though we do not speak. We are to walk worthy, giving a right representation. Like the brother said, we are ambassadors of Christ. Giving a right representation of Christ. The speaking of an angry word is like flint striking flint, it at once kindles wrathful feelings. But the part here that stands out the most to me is where she says, to feel angry or to feel angry even though we do not speak. So there are some things where it was discussed earlier how you're tolerating people. So to tolerate something now is that you're feeling that you want to say something, but you ain't saying nothing. You can just keep, keep your tongue bite, keep your lip bite. But we, we, we would be so imbued with the love of God that the Holy Spirit is shed in our hearts that the feeling of anger 
would cease to exist inside of us. And, and the power of God is able to do this once we have a surrendered will. So much so that the text where many of us would use to say, well, possibly be angry and say not, so there's nothing wrong with being angry. Yet he was he goes on to say, put away anger. I think this way it says in Child Guidance Space 91, it is a sin to feel angry even though we do not speak. Okay, understood. Thanks very much. Um, we have Georgia. Georgia. Georgia, go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I had the same discussion yesterday with an atheist because this his reason for hating church is that um, uh, we always fight in amongst each other, and there's always one opinion. Uh, over the other. Uh, the discussion was about um, uh, murdering doctors and bombing clinics that um, provide abortion. And that's an example of his being angry and, and of people being angry and sinning. And he asked me, what did I think about that? So I said, well, you can have righteous indignation over a matter that is, it burns inside you for a change. But their response to abortions and homosexuality is to go to the Bible and have discussions with these people, not expecting a quick change, like do what I say or I'll bomb you, but expecting to, to teach the other person why it's what they're doing is wrong why it burns me with righteous indignation to want to see God's will done, why thou shalt not kill applies with them and not with me bombing a, um, a clinic. Because if I'm saying that uh, I can, I'm killing these people because they are killing children, it's still kill, thou shalt not kill. The, the other thing is uh, the Jews were filled with that kind of anger at, at the things that Jesus was saying that was pricking their conscience and um, making them feel that they're not perfect. And so they didn't have righteous indignation. They had anger that not only took them to killing um, our Savior, but trying to do it before the Sabbath, something that they thought was more important so I can see how um, misguided anger at like being the Sabbath more important than keeping the son of Jesus alive or the death of the doctor and the nurse being more important than, than keeping babies alive. So uh, uh, that kind of um, anger, that righteous indignation that makes us feel that we're right to be angry with others that are not loving the way we love or do things the way we love. That's the thing that we shouldn't take to bed. But I, I think that if you, your child did something and, um, uh, and you want to make sure that your child doesn't do that thing again and you're upset about it, again, I, I don't feel that we should, I know a lot of people can disagree with me, is to like this person talked about in testimonies that build up in us that we beat our children till they're almost bleeding to stop them. I think that's a good time to talk and discuss why is it wrong? Uh, how can we change this and, and help them to think through their own decisions. So I, I came in late because I'm on this course and seven o'clock my time is 11 o'clock your time. So I don't know if someone else discussed those things, but that's my take on it, dealing with a, um, an atheist yesterday, yesterday evening. Honestly, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, just, just one thing to note, um, Brother Peter. I, I see your hand is raised. Just give uh, this comment here, and it will let you comment or ask a question. Um, the whole concept of righteous indignation, Brother Bruce, Ronnie Bruce, would have shared some comments from inspiration that I think. 
answers that particular matter. Um, because when we are angry, and the, and the anger that we are told to put away in verse 31 of Ephesians 4 is that anger that is motivated by self, whether it is wounded pride, whether it is um, well, it, it is motivated by self, hurt, whatever it may be. And that is the anger that as Christians, we must have the victory over. But when it says, so when it says be angry and sin not, the only, as Brother Bruce showed from the, I can't remember where exactly the quote was taken. The only time that we can be angry and sin not is if we have the anger that Christ showed us in scripture where persons would have done things wrong and they were they were adamant in their wrongdoing and there were times that christ gently said something and there are other times that christ was not as gentle in relating to such a person but yet still even though it may come over to us because we were not there but even though when we read the written words it may come over to us as though you know, we, we would picture Christ doing something the way how we would do it. But we are told that even when Christ did things or said things, there were tears in his in his um, voice, even as he rebuked persons, as he addressed particular situations, even his own disciples who failed to understand his mission at, certain, at some points in time. Right, so I just wanted to, to mention that.